of God, a gathering home, and we will tell the story how we overcome, or we will understand it better by and by, sing it by and by, oh, when morning comes, I'll tell you all the saints of God. The gathering home, and we will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Let the church say amen. Amen. Uh, before we go into my portion of the lesson, let us once again go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us this morning as we rightly divide your word of truth and we preach unto the hearers the divine and holy will of god and the gospel of jesus christ we pray this morning that everything that we do will be well pleasing in thy sight and that your word will have recourse in the hearts of all those who hear it and that we might go forward in the upcoming week and do your holy and divine will. Ask that you be with me, that you be with Brother Jenkins as he come forward after me, that all things will be done to thine glory and to thine honor. In Jesus' name, let us all say, Amen. 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 Thankful again to have another opportunity to preach unto the hearing and grant the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was it like to be in the presence of Jesus? What was it like to be in the presence of Jesus? I'd like to talk with you this morning on this particular thought question about what was it like to be in the divine presence of Jesus? What was it like to be around him. I want you to just think about that question of what it was really like to be in the presence of Jesus, to be around him, to see his majesty, to behold his power, to witness his divine nature, to hear his voice. Try to imagine what was it like to see Jesus in action? What was it like to feel him, to touch him, to actually be in his presence and to, to be in the divine presence of the Lord, our Savior? We're talking about Jesus Christ. And another question, how did it feel for him to be rejected, to be smitten, to be spat upon, to be jeered and mocked and beaten and ultimately judged and crucified upon that cruel cross of Calvary, all at the hands of mere men. And remember, it was Jesus that gave up a home in heaven, a seat on the throne of our almighty God to come down from heaven and to live and breathe among us on this mundane earth. So as you begin to think about all of this, Think about Jesus. Think about his divine origin as the only begotten son of God. And just think about how Jesus functioned as a living soul here on earth. So as we get into this message this morning, please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark that was read earlier in chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, commencing at verse number 2, here the Bible reads, and after six days, Jesus take with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. You'll see an account of this also in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9, and Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. 
So in Mark chapter 9, verse 3, the Bible reads, And his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And that was, if that was not enough to shock him, amaze Peter and James and John, notice verse 2, Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now remember, these great and powerful men of God were lived countless centuries before Christ was born. But yet, can you imagine the sight of them and how amazed Peter, James, and John were when they could see these men of God up there on the mountain talking with the Lord, Amen. talking with the Savior, Amen. conversing with Jesus. Now Peter, notice his reaction when he, when he uttered these words. To Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elias, and one for thee. For he knew not what to say, because he was what? So afraid. Verse 7, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Verse 8. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man save Jesus only with themselves. Verse 9. And when they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them and said that they should tell no man what the things that they have seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have an extremely important message in this passage of scripture. Notice Peter was not encouraged by the voice of God to build the three tabernacles of worship. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for the Lord. So with that being said, what about now? What about us? What about the denominational world. If God didn't want a church to be built in the name of Moses or Elijah, do you think or do you honestly think that God will approve of all of these denominations of religions of faith sprouting up each and every day? Think about that. This is something that we should all take heed of. That is that Jesus has what? Preeminence over any and all man-made religions that we can conjure up today. Let me say that again. Jesus has what? Preeminence over any and all man-made religions that we see here on earth that were established by the thoughts and the ideas of man. So let us learn from the example of the transfiguration as Jesus recorded in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. As we go forward, Here's something else to consider. Brother, can you get this for me? Matthew, Matthew chapter, Brother Roger, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Mm -hmm. And after six, six days, Jesus taking Peter, James and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then Peter said unto, the, unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Eli Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Amen. Amen. And remember, all of these accounts of Jesus' transfiguration speaks of the importance of appreciating the majesty 
and the power and the divine nature of Jesus' holiness and that he, Jesus, only Jesus has supreme authority. And then Jesus not only had that supreme authority when he was on earth, he has the same authority in heaven and he'll have the same authority when he comes back as the Thessalonian letter says, to judge the world and to bring the church back to God in heaven. Amen. So remember that. When he comes back from the church, I want you to be encouraged this morning. I want all of us to endure all of life's trials and tribulations and not allow the troubles and the cares of this world to cause our hearts to grow weary. And to remember and realize that Jesus knows all of our trouble. Amen. And as the song goes, Jesus what? Knows the pain you feel. Amen. He can save Amen. and he can heal. Amen. So remember what Jesus told the disciples in the book of Matthew. And at the end of Matthew in chapter 28, when he was giving them what we call the Great Commission, notice what Jesus said at the end of Matthew in verse number 18 of chapter 28. If you turn to Matthew chapter 28 in verse number 18, notice what Jesus said. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven, notice that, and in earth. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them. Notice this, we forget many times to do what? To teach them to observe all things, not some things, but all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And notice the promise, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. Amen. So remember, Jesus will never leave us. Jesus will be there for us, but we must abide in his holy word. We must do what Jesus has commanded us to do. We must forsake our own way of thinking, our own way of doing things. We must learn to lean upon the word of God. Amen. We must Amen. learn to depend upon God and we must learn to never, ever lean upon our own understanding. We must follow in his footsteps. We must live by his examples. We must live by the examples that we can read about in the Holy Bible. We must learn how to trust in the Lord. We must learn how to obey his holy word. So this morning, I want us to look at a few examples about being in the presence of Jesus, and then this message will be yours, and Brother Roger will come up. Please turn to the book of John, chapter 6, the book of John, chapter 6, starting at verse number 16 and concluding at verse number 24. That's the book of John, chapter 6, starting at verse number 6. 16 and concluding in verse number 24. Here the Bible reads. And when even was now come, when even when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship. Mm -hmm. And went over this and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty four long, they see Jesus walking on the sea mm -hmm. and drew nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. And he said unto them, It is I, mm -hmm. be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land, was at the land where they went. The following day, 
when the people which stood at the, on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one very into his disciples were in. And Jesus went not with the with disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. How be it? There came another boat from Tyrus High unto the place where they did eat bread after the law after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and became and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when which cometh thou thither? Amen. And just as Jesus walked on the water, on the water of that sea, Jesus can and he will carry us through all the tumultuous waves of life. Jesus will not leave any of us faithful Christians stranded at sea. Jesus will always bring us all safely home to the shore. Amen. Only if we trust in him. Only if we obey him. Only if we do his blessed will. Only if we're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But Jesus is always there for for us, as long as we abide in his holy word, the Bible, Jesus will abide with us. So as you think deeply about this message, there's something that is really important about the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want us to remember the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to turn there to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 23 in the Gospel of Luke. So bear with me. The Gospel of Luke chapter 23 and verse number 27, notice this. And there followed him a great company of people, women, which bewailed and lamented him. And Jesus turned unto them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For behold, the days are coming when they which would say, blessed are the bearing, blessed are the wounds that are never bound in a pack that never gave stuff. So, and then they shall begin to say to the mountain, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to a green tree, what will be done in the dry? And there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, and there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the left and one on the right. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding and the rulers with them derided him, saying, He saved others, so let him save himself, if he be the chosen of God. And the soldiers mocked him, and coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a subscription was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. Notice verse 39. And one of the male factors, which pain railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. And the other answered and saying, Does not know or fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? For we indeed receive our due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou come into thy kingdom. <clears throat> Notice what Jesus said to him. 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou will be with me in paradise. I want us to gather two things from that passage of scripture I just read. You see Jesus and his humility and his love and in his spirit of forgiveness asking the Father God to forgive those people who were putting him to death on the cross. That's a supreme example for us that no matter what a person does to us, no matter what happens to us, no matter what evil is imparted upon us, that we must have the spirit of forgiveness. And then, the other thing I want you to gather is this. In his death, Jesus had compassion on the other person who asked him to save him from his sin. Here you have Jesus saving one of the men while he's being put to death. So on our last day, our mission should always be to withdraw our last breath on this earth to save the souls that we come in contact with. So remember that, that Jesus always wants us to be steadfast and to be ready to teach and preach his holy and divine will. So let us not ever forget that supreme sacrifice that Jesus made. Let us never overlook the fact that he asked the Father God to forgive them for they knew not what they were doing. Let us allow the example of Jesus on the cross to resonate in our hearts. So today, let us be shining examples to the world. Examples in purity, examples in forgiveness, examples in love, and examples in forbearing one another, so putting up with one another for living among the faults of one another. And finally, let us realize what Jesus did after he was put to death on the cross, that he rose again, that he's sitting on the right hand of God, Amen. that he's coming back again to judge the whole world, that we must be found what faithful in the Lord when Jesus comes back. And let us always stand on that battlefield, waving that blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ, and let us always be ready, well-equipped to do the will of God. I'll yield right now to Brother Rogers so he can come up and do this portion of the lesson. Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving along to face temptation, so tell me now where could I go but to the Lord? Tell me now where. Could I go? Where could I go? Don't you know that I'm seeking a refuge for my soul? Well, I need then a friend, oh, to save me in the end. Tell me now, where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. I'd like to thank Brother Byron for that wonderful lesson on our resurrection. But however, we honor the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every day. Amen. Every day we honor him. On Sunday, when the congregation comes together, when the saints come together upon the first day of the week, we are given the commands to have communion. That puts us in to the body of Christ doing his divine will. But one of the most important things that Brother Byron was preaching, he wants us to be able to hear. Remember, brothers and sisters, if we do not hear, we are going to be lost. But hearing is part of the first steps of knowing how to become into the body of Christ. 
But when you hear, it brings you unto. And what we will do now is understand that we must hear the word. Without first hearing the word of God, we will never know what are sinners and that the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 23. I mean, Romans 3 and verse 23 and Romans 6 and 23. Without hearing, we wouldn't know of Jesus' sacrifice, of our sins, of our need for him. It's also where our faith comes from Romans 10 and 17. Father, we should only listen to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew 17, 5, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, as well as Matthew 28 and 18. To be able to hear, to be able to make that decision that I'm going to obey the command which I have heard about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we hear those things, it is required that we must believe what we have heard. Amen. We must believe what we have heard. For an example, you say your name. Whatever your name is, you had to hear it first. And once you heard it, you began to believe what you heard. And then you was able to read and you can see the inscriptions and how your name is printed. But from the onset, we had to hear the divine word of God in order to know that there is a God. And once we hear that, we must believe that which we have heard. Merely hearing the word of God doesn't save. Merely hearing the word of God does not save. We must believe what we hear or we are not likely to obey God's command. In John 8 and 24, Jesus says, If you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Yet, belief is not enough, according to James 2 and 24. This is things we must do. What God commands, or rather he demands that we do, and that is his divine will according to Matthew 7 and 21. These things that we must bear in mind, that we must always be willing to hear the word of God, we must be willing to hear the word of God, read it for ourselves, and believe that which we have heard. Those things that are clouded in our mind and which we may not believe, study to show that self-approved. The answers are always in the question. You got a question about God? Go to the book. Believe what you have just read and make life more responsible. And once you believe if you're not a Christian, one of the things that we all should continue to do and that is to repent. To repent of our evil deeds. To repent for any false worship that we are participating in. We need to repent for any idle words that we may have said that have caused one to look at us in a different way. We need to repent for all those things that cause us to stumble in making it into the gates of heaven. We must repent for of our sins. Sin is what separates us from God according to Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Therefore, if we intend to seek God's forgiveness, we must be willing to repent of our sins. Repentance means turning away and making the effort to sin no more, according to 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. If we are willing to repent of our sins, we cannot be saved unless we do so. To repent, to change our life, to change our conversation, to change our very demeanor when we repent, meaning we're not going to accept sin as one of the main focuses in our life. We are turning away from it. We are being strong enough to battle the devil in the wilds in which he comes. Therefore, if we intend to seek God's forgiveness, we must be willing to repent of our sins. We must be willing to give up all those things 
that cause us to stumble and miss the gates of heaven. If we are willing to repent of our sins, we cannot be saved if we are not willing. According to Acts 3.19, Acts 17, 30 through 31. And once we repent, one of the things that all of us can say is to confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Amen. You can ask people today, do you believe in Christ? Or do you believe in Jesus? A lot of people will say no. They'll say no. And if you ask them why, they'll say, that's not for that. I make my own decisions. I make life for myself. They don't believe that it is Jesus that is directing their path. And yet they will boldly stand before you and deny him. And when we confess, those that wish to be saved must confess their faith in Jesus, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. It was Jesus Christ himself who said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also there before my Father which is in heaven, according to Matthew 10 and 32. The scriptures give us an example of one who confessed their faith in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And note verse 37. Thank you, Brother Harrison. We love it. We love it. And once we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, then we are to be baptized into the body of Christ. Amen. Just know, you heard the word, you believe the word, you repented of your sins, you confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. All those things brought you unto Christ. That is unto, meaning how do I get into Christ? So the Bible tells us in these days about baptism, that some think baptism isn't necessary. Others believe we are saved before we are baptized. Note that the scripture says baptism does. Let's take a look. Baptism shows us a good conscience toward God. The apostle Peter confirms baptism doeth now saves us. First Peter chapter 3 verse 21. Baptism washes away sin according to Acts 22 and 16. Baptism gives us entry into Christ Jesus according to Romans 6 and verse 3. According to Galatians 3 and 27. Puts us into Christ. Jesus, our authority, made baptism necessary when he gave the command in Mark 16, 16. In other words, our sins are not washed away and we are not in Christ until we are baptized. Brothers and sisters, it is very important that we understand our position in leading people to Christ. Hopefully, they will give their life to you. We must be faithful unto death. We must remain faithful. While baptism puts us into Christ and his blood washes away our sins, we must still be obedient and faithful to God. Otherwise, we will lose our soul. The Bible tells us, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life, according to Revelation 2.10. If we haven't met any of these conditions and you want to obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today, please let us know. Contact a church of Christ in your area. Let them know that you have heard the word. You believe what you have heard and you're willing to repent of your sins and you want to be baptized to put you into the body of Christ. A lot of us come unto it we have not been baptized. Some of us have been baptized, but you have to wonder, what were you baptized under? Just know that there's only one baptism. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. If there's anyone that would like to give their life to Christ at this time, please come forth. If we sing the song, then the invitation.
softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. This is where it shows that we are to be part of the body of Christ. We come from the Father above. And coming home here on earth gives us the opportunity to love and to worship and to cherish Christ. Because once we get in heaven, that's all it's about. It's not about us worshiping man, worshiping church, worshiping these things. It's about us worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Brothers and sisters, don't wait. Don't wait. We don't know when that time is going to come. We don't. Let's keep our minds and our hearts focused on Jesus. I want to thank you very much for your kind lesson. If you have any questions, you may ask anything concerning Brother Harrison, you need to ask him. But more likely, more than likely, we're on the same page, and I will be able to answer as well, as well as any brother that are members of the body of Christ. And not only that, we have some powerful sisters that will set you straight once you become a member of the body of Christ. If you go going straight, they are there with love. The brothers are there with love to keep you grounded and rooted in the body of Christ. Thank you very much. We have come to another part of our Christian worship, which is communion. The Bible tells us upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. There is no need for us to serve eggs and have rabbits running around, but that is not the honor and the respect due for the day of resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is not so. He has commanded us to partake of the bread and of the cup. And the Bible tells us that he took bread and break it and said, this is my body. Eat this and remember to me. After the same man also he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, blessed it, he said, take, this is my body. This is my cup with New Testament and my blood. This do as often as you do this and remember to me. He also gave us instructions as well. He says, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, if we eat it unworthily, we eat it and bring it damnation unto ourselves. But let a man examine himself. But he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not concerning the Lord's body. This is very powerful. Look into ourselves and understand that we are part of the body of Christ. Let's give thanks for the bread and the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come forward to partake of your Lord's Supper. And we pray that um, all the things that we do as we acknowledge the bread and we acknowledge the cup of the shedded blood that Jesus Christ shed for each and every one of us on the cross of Calvary, as we acknowledge that, we pray that we be ever mindful of the suffering and the pain and the sacrifice he made for each one of us while we were yet sinners. All this we ask and give thanks for. In Jesus Christ's name, let us all say, Amen.
know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, my Jesus died up on the cross. Well, I know it was the blood for me. We have come to another part of our Christian worship, which is giving. And the Bible defines that upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him a story of God is prospering him, that there be no gathering when I call. He also gave us instructions about giving. Jesus says when we give, he will give back to us, pressed down, shaking together, and running forth. The Bible also gives us instructions that those who give sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Those who give bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Let every man give according to a purpose in his heart. For God loves us a cheerful giver. Let us give thanks for those that are about to give. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back a portion to that which you have given us for the operation and the taking the care of the building that we are assembled in. We just ask dear God that we continue to trust in your divine word that all we do will be respectful and honor with the money that we use unto you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for this offering. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to meditate, to continue to mitigate for us to the Father by our divine work. We just ask, dear God, that you see the pleasing work that we are doing for you, and that you will continue to bless us in the way you see we stand in the need of. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, brothers and sisters, it's been a wonderful day. Today, uh, Griffin Road is having a, a mini uh, gospel meeting today. Uh, it's all day, I think. I'm not sure when it ends. However, um, they'll be there for four ministers that 